morning in Europe and good afternoon and in Delhi. Uh, I'm Ugo Tramballi, Senior Advisor and uh, Head of uh, India Desk of ISPI, together with uh, Françoise Nicolas, a Senior Fellow of the uh, Institut de, de Française des Relations Internationales, IFRI. We have the pleasure to be in conversation this morning with uh, uh, Minister Subramaniam Jashanka, uh, veteran diplomat, uh, former head of Tata's Global Corporate Affairs and now Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, Minister, Minister Shankar, I, I give you the floor because I, I presume you want to make some uh, introductory remarks. Welcome, first and, for, or first and foremost. Thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, let me say that it's a great pleasure to uh, be back at the Met Dialogue. Uh, I wish I was back there in person like last year, uh, but I will settle for a virtual interaction this year. Uh, hope by next year everything is back to normal. Uh, uh, I was asked uh, to make some opening remarks on rethinking migration. And it is a subject which is obviously uh, one which is uh, very central to India's engagement with the world. Now, uh, we obviously live in the age of globalization and interdependence and interpenetration are two uh, processes which are central to globalization. And if you actually look at what is globalization, I think a lot of it is the indivisibility of our existence. And four of those expressions are in migration, in climate change, as we've seen now in pandemics, and in terrorism. These are all areas where national governments will try and shape outcomes, but international cooperation is absolutely critical. Now, we must recognize that the migration of workers and professionals is as central to globalization as the mobility of capital, goods, and services. Uh, in fact, as the knowledge economy gains ground, uh, global availability of talent is going to become more salient. And clearly here, uh, demographic factors also have a bearing because uh, some societies have more talent because of their demography. So, so what I would really urge uh, you know, this conference uh, to do is really look at migration and mobility in a composite way and see it in a sense as a human expression of the transfer of technology, of the promotion of uh, innovation, of the building of business and of the sharing of knowledge. And facilitating that would actually be central to all our economic prospects. Now we are coming through, I hope, uh, through the COVID pandemic. Uh, and I think what we are all agreed on is that the world order would be very different. We are not sure what it will be, but we know it will be very different. But what I guess we can all uh, more or less anticipate is that a post-COVID world order would put a greater premium on how we redefine national security. That national security will be much more about economic security, health security, in many countries, food security, energy security. And I would suggest to you that reliable human resources is intrinsic to creating more resilient supply chains. Now, if you look at the global talent pool, I think you will not disagree with me that India has a very special place in it. Uh, we actually provide uh, uh, human resources across the entire spectrum of economic activity. In the Gulf alone, uh, we have today more than 9 million Indian workers. Overall, I think in the world, if you look at the non-resident Indians and persons of Indian origin, I think we'd be looking somewhere between about 30 to 34 million uh, people. A million Indian students study abroad at any time. So, and, and these students really, and, and those who have uh, moved on in the professional career will actually, uh, you know, influence uh, uh, areas like engineering, medicine, and R&D in a very, very uh, fundamental way. And in fact, when it comes to students, I would suggest 
in fact they will be increasingly uh, central to global education business uh, and you can see that already in the us and canada and australia etc maybe even in uk now when you think about this talent pool that i'm talking about i mean uh, you can have uh, you know the ceos of google and microsoft at one level uh, and you have people who keep our everyday life going uh, at another so in one way or the other they've actually already started uh, to affect the way the uh, world works now because migration and mobility is a fact of life i think it's important to ensure that it is legal and it is safe uh, migration we are talking about that when it comes to mobility that we encourage market driven uh, mobility because that is uh, essential finally for a globalized uh, economy and what we should guard against is illegal migration because illegal migration is actually the feedstock of organized crime groups uh, it therefore this whole subject has been uh, something that we've discussed uh, in bilateral and multilateral diplomacy we are among the 164 countries of the un who have signed the global compact on safe orderly and regular uh, migration in 2018 uh, with the eu uh, we have a declaration of common agenda on migration and mobility that we agreed to in 2016 uh, through that we set up actually a india eu high level dialogue on migration and mobility that meets regularly we have concluded a migration mobility partnership agreement with france 2 years ago uh, we have agreed to it in principle with portugal uh, we are working with italy with uh, germany with the benelux countries uh, so uh, this is something which is actually a very active part of the india eu conversation now we have also taken similar steps with the gulf countries uh, in fact uh, Uh, uh we have uh, to to ensure because it's such a large volume of uh, uh migrants that we have there uh we we actually have an electronic platform to register the migrants we have created 24/7 helplines and resource centers for their safety and welfare we have actually a, a sort of a grievances platform which is called madad which is the indian it's an acronym the word means help and even the recruitment of people uh, providing them orientation skills we have sort of digitized it organized it uh, in a way now what the this year in particular has taught us is that migration also comes with its own responsibilities we all woke up when the covid hit us to discover how many of our people were abroad uh, and obviously we were concerned for them and uh, i can share with you that where india was concerned we helped uh, uh, more than 100000 foreigners living in india to go back home and we have brought back 2.8 million uh, indians you know there could be tourists there could be shipping crews there could be workers there could be professionals back home to india so my point to sum up is when we are rethinking migration today particularly in the in the covid and the post covid world we need to look at migration as something essential to globalization it's going to happen it's in our interest to make it happen safely legally it is central to more talent and innovation it is i think uh, very important to create greater business and in some senses i would say it also adds to a much more multicultural world uh, i believe that rethinking migration will be will in in many ways define what would be a truly democratic and globalized uh, existence so those are some thoughts which i thought uh, i would present before you and i'd be open to talk about that or any other issue in today's world in which you may have an interest thank you thank you minister Uh, I'm, I have some worry that mm, at the end of the pandemic we could find the same world we left uh, uh, before the pandemic, uh, but we need to have a positive uh, agenda. Um, last year, when we met in flesh and blood, we were talking about uh, the traditional non-aligned stand of India. We said uh, uh, many friends, few first, uh, no ally. 
uh, since then, China, China became much more, more assertive than one year ago. Uh, perhaps uh, that could mean that um, this time has come to find out some more formal allies, uh, both in uh, Asia and in the, in the Mediterranean? Uh, you know, first of all, I must tell you uh, that line which uh, you articulated uh, I incorporated in my book, which I was happy to tell you came out this autumn. Uh, so uh, uh, I don't know if it's available in Europe, but I'd be very happy to send you a copy. Uh, Thank you. Because I, I think that interaction, what I did was I put a lot of my interactions over the last two years into a book, which explores in India and you know, the global order in different ways. But let's come to your question. Uh, non-alignment uh, and you know how do recent events affect it? Look, what is non-alignment? Non-alignment is actually was a, a approach that countries like India took in the 1950s and 60s onwards to maintain their independence at the height of the Cold War when there was pressure on them from both blocs saying you must join us. Okay, so the end of the day, it is about maintaining your independence, okay. But maintaining your independence has to go hand in hand with ensuring your national interest or national security. So when it comes to practicing, you know, that policy, in, in real life, you, you make adjustments depending on what are the challenges and what are the uh, opportunities, where are the gains, where are the pressures. Uh, so it doesn't go necessarily in a linear way. Okay. Now, uh, today, I, I think the era, I mean, in a sense, there's still a non-aligned uh, group of countries. Uh, we meet every year. Uh, we met last year in Azerbaijan. Uh, so, more, you know, that sense of being more independent from bloc politics has grown because the Cold War ended. Now, today, for me, that uh, fundamental approach to uh, foreign policy continues. Now, I'll have to see how I deal with the challenges that I face, you know, what I face this year or what will come next year or, uh, and see, you know, obviously one, how do I face up to it? But also I will see how I leverage the global environment uh, to my advantage. But I do uh, feel that given our history, you know, and, and I don't think it's only us. I think most countries uh, who were colonized are very, very sensitive on the issue of their independence of, uh, you know, of uh, action and independence of thought. So uh, the, the, to my mind, actually the era of alliances is diluted. You know? uh, I, I'm not saying that alliances go away. I mean, Italy is a member of an alliance. Europe is largely covered by an alliance. Uh, but I think what an alliance means, uh, you know, how it plays out, I think all of that's going to change. Certainly, the last four years of, uh, you know, policies out of Washington is, is compelling a significant rethink as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, I, you know, I, I think you you kind of put your finger on something, but I would very uh, respectfully suggest that the answer you post is a is an outdated answer. I, I don't think that's the way to go. I think the way to go is to understand it's a multipolar world, leverage the multipolarity of the world, uh, and then deal with the challenges of the day as effectively as you can. Thank you. Francoise, please. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Minister. Well, let me ask you something, a question, a very basic question related to very recent developments. Not uh, surprisingly, I guess, I would like to ask you a question about the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, okay, mm -hmm. RCEP for, for short. Well, uh, India participated to the negotiations from day one, and it went through lengthy discussions, painful discussions, if I understand properly, during seven years. And uh, not at the last minute, but very late in the process, decided to pull out of the negotiations. And this RCEP has been signed uh, recently, was signed on uh, November 15th, without India in it. 
Well, being an economist by training, I would argue that uh, it was most probably a missed opportunity for India. The reason why I'm saying that is that usually these preferential trading arrangements are about trade, of course, but they are also to a large extent about using external pressure to help push through domestic reforms. And so in the case of India, I would argue that <laughs> it would have been an excellent opportunity to do such a thing. So uh, my question to you, is, well, there are two questions actually. The first one is, why is it then that India pulled out of this uh, agreement? What was the point and isn't it a missed opportunity? And a secondary question, uh, which is directly related to the, the EU is, is it on the part of India, a position of principle on preferential trading arrangements or would India be ready to engage in other preferential trading arrangements, in particular in a FTA with the EU. The negotiation has been ongoing for a long time. So should we drop any hope on the EU side about India joining or finally participating in this FTA or not? Thank you. Uh, let me answer your question backwards, okay? Start with the EU and then come to the option. First of all, no. It is not a question of principle. Uh, India has nothing in principle against uh, free trade agreements or preferential trade agreements. Uh, uh, we have, in fact, a current interest with many partners. And specifically where the EU is concerned, you know, we were negotiating with the EU till 2013, okay? Then in 2013, they could not close out the deal. Now, this was uh, the tenure of the previous government, the end of the tenure of the previous government. So there was a change of government in 2014. The government of Prime Minister Modi uh, offered to the EU that they would like to reopen or continue those negotiations. In fact, it was the EU which took the stance from 2014 saying, look, Right now, we have other priorities. I don't know if we are ready, uh, you know. So for the last six years, and I say this as someone who sat in the room, heard my own leaders say this, heard the responses from the EU leadership. The, the reluctance to engage from 2014, this I can testify personally, is not from India's side. It is from EU side, even today, okay? And I, in the last one year, I have been to Brussels twice and brought up the subject with the, with the commissioner mandated to deal with us. And that was pretty much the answer I got, which was that, you know, we need to think this through. We're not sure we want to do this at this time. So in fact, whether somebody has something against FTS, you should ask the EU, you should be asking it. Okay, so that's my first part. Secondly, uh, what, you know, uh, what was it, you know, where was the problem with the RCEP, okay? Now, bear in mind, we, we do uh, have existing FTAs with the ASEAN, ASEAN collectively, with many individual ASEAN members, with Japan, with Korea. So if you looked at the RCEP uh, partners, we did not have with China, uh, with Australia, and with New Zealand, okay? So there will be the net additions, you know, apart from which the quality difference between our existing RCAs and what the RCA was also a fact, okay? Now, I, I think when you said as an economist, you feel where it, it, is, it gives you access to larger markets, uh, you should look actually at our trade record with the RCEP countries, all the RCEP countries, including China, uh, for the last 15, 20 years. Our trade deficit has just gone up massively with them. Okay. Now, uh, a lot of our negotiations were to address problems that we saw coming out of our experiences with. Uh, these current FTAs with the ASEAN, with Japan, with uh, Korea, etc. You know, some of it related to market access, 
uh, some of it uh, related to the uh, possibility of import surges because again uh, you know we were not uh, uh, sort of uh, assured uh, of actually how the market economy exactly works in this zone uh, so we had a whole set of issues okay now we entered the the uh, negotiations and we stayed with it because we were very sincere in our desire to to look at this opportunity but finally we took a we had to make a judgment as a government whether we joined an arrangement where many of our basic concerns were not met and you know in in any negotiation not just an fta negotiation because you have entered a negotiation doesn't mean you have to agree to the conclusion even if it is not in your interest okay so uh, the uh, the idea that you know there would have been great benefits waiting for us at the end of the rainbow i sorry i don't buy that okay in fact if you ask people in india i don't know about economists definitely in the real world of business you go and ask people in the business world in india so tell us what has been your experience with the uh, some of these you know asian ftas how has been your trading experience with the rcep partners all the rcep partners i don't think you'll get a very good feedback the uh, the related uh, issue here is also what you said it will force reforms uh, on you look i i think uh, what in many ways my view has happened in the last 15 years that cheap often subsidized imports from countries who are not all market economies have actually delayed reforms in it because people found oh i have a solution by importing it from outside you know i have cheap components why should i make a component industry okay so i would actually argue that entering into arrangements which in a sense do not work for you uh, which where, where really comparative true comparative advantages do not come into play where there are a lot of non market factors at play i would argue that far from encouraging reform they've had a very very deleterious impact on our domestic economy and i think the way to go my government thinks the way to go is actually today to consciously uh, uh, to consciously uh, uh, expand enhance national capacities to encourage uh, more uh, business more innovation more skill in india provide a better infrastructure provide a better enabling business environment and then work with partners who are more complementary who may not pose some of the challenges that we encountered uh, which i have spoken about thank you minister um some more some less uh, every country uh, is recalibrating its relation with the united states prime minister modi and uh, president trump were very how could i say very close some so for some extent very similar uh, modi is a self reliant nation uh, at mani barbarat i beg your pardon for my very bad uh, hindi accent um reminds me um, america first at the end of the day no i i disagree with you uh, i disagree with you because uh, Uh, one atmanirbhar bharat is all about actually creating more capacities and more confidence and uh, more creativity at home we never say india first we could have we didn't okay because we want to send a message that more capacities at home are intended for more use abroad we want to do more with the global economy we don't want to do less with the global economy you know so we are not asking our businesses we are big investments in europe okay we are not telling them come back home on the country you know we send our talent abroad we are not telling our talent oh don't go to those countries stay in india so 
I, I think this analogy between Atmanirbhar Bharat and America first, I would dispute that. Number two, when it comes to the United States, look, today, structurally, in international relations, India and the United States have started developing more and more convergences. Why did it happen? It happened really because the Cold War ended. When the Cold War ended, a lot of what America had against India was no longer relevant. So if you actually start seeing the sort of the temperature graph of Indo-American relations, you can actually see from the 90s, gradually it goes up and then it goes up higher and higher. And I would say, looking back and as someone who's been involved with this relationship for now almost 40 years, uh, in some ways, Clinton's visit to India in 99, most people agree would be a turning point. A great speech uh, in the had, parliament. Right. I remember. And then we had George Bush, George W. Bush, uh, who did something extraordinary for the relationship, which was the India-US nuclear deal. Then we had uh, Barack Obama. Uh, and that relationship actually flowered as well. And Barack Obama was the first American president to be present at the Republic Day uh, in India. And then we had Donald Trump, with whom we got along well. So, look, it is it is a test of our. Uh, it's a testament to our diplomacy that we have had four administrations, and with each one of them, actually, our relationship has grown. So, you should be giving us a certificate. Uh, now, my point is the reason why that has happened is because there is a, a structural uh, sort of convergence here that. So I am very confident that, uh, you know, India-US relations will continue to do well. I think there are larger forces, in a sense, which are, uh, which are supporting it. And, you know, and in, in diplomacy, in foreign policy, as you know, the more you do, the more, more possibilities open up. So it is an area which, it's a, it's a relationship which really covers pretty much every, every domain of human activity. There's hardly anything which doesn't go on between India and the United States. So I am, uh, you know, hopeful that is how it will continue to go. Thank you. Francoise. Sure, Mr. Minister, I would like to ask you, I think it will be the last, uh, the last question because time flies. Uh, I would like to ask you a question about Huawei and 5G. So if I understand properly, uh, India at first uh, agreed to allow Huawei to participate in the very early trials in, in late 2019, and then uh, obviously not giving in to uh, US pressure to ban uh, Huawei. And then after a couple of months, uh, there were a shift in India's position with uh, Huawei being de facto banned, uh, even though this is not officially uh, the case, not formally the, uh, the case. So could you please explain what caused this shift and what the exact uh, position of the Indian government is on what has now become a very sensitive issue, as you know. You know, uh, uh, I'm aware of the developments at the end of 2019, where some, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, decisions were made about the trials. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, I don't think any formal decision has been taken. Uh, uh, by the government on the 5G issue uh, thereafter. Uh, so, so I'm I'm uh, not quite sure. You know the way you put it is really the way uh, way it is. I think, uh, you know, frankly, during this entire year, everybody's been preoccupied with uh, most of all with the COVID. Of course, we have had many other challenges, including on our borders. Uh, and uh, the line of actual control with China. Uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, but I, I think to uh, portray uh, it as a decision which has sort of changed the 2019 decision, I'm not sure that is, that is an accurate way of describing it right now. So it's still, it's still open then. We don't know yet. We'll see. Wait and see. Well, I, I, as I said, I don't know that any decision was taken formally after 2019. Okay, so we'll we'll keep an eye on this issue, which is, uh, as I said earlier, a very sensitive issue for for all of us. Well, unfortunately, I'm afraid that time is up. 
And so we have to bring this uh, discussion to, uh, to a close. It was a real pleasure for us all, I, I guess, to exchange with you, Mr. M Minister. And on behalf of uh, ISPI, let me thank you very warmly for uh, the vis this very frank and uh, open discussion. And uh, of course, our hope is that we can continue this conversation very soon, but in, in flesh and blood, <laughs> in person, be it in, uh, in Delhi, in Milan, or in Paris, perhaps. So thank you, Ms. M Mr. Thank Minister, you. very thank much you. again. Thank you. thank you, Minister. Thank you, pleasure.